um, the greatest gift that I got was from Bo. Because Bo taught me how to write. Bo is, Bo is, as far as I'm concerned, the scribe of Narcotics Anonymous. And if y'all don't know that, you should know that. Uh, we, you know, he says, well, no, it's, it's Narcotics Anonymous. No, Bo is the scribe for Narcotics Anonymous. That's how I always see him. It's how I think of him. It's what I believe to be true about him. Um, I had a few days clean, and he said, well, you need to start writing. And I said, to who? <laughs> and he said, well, to yourself. I was like, well, okay. He said, because you don't know anybody else yet. <laughs> and uh, I, sat in his, I sat in his print shop in the middle of the night, and he handed me a pen and a piece of paper. And that has started in a journey that has been incredible. And um, every time I pick up a basic text, Bo Sewell is in every page of it. And I'm grateful. I love you. You're my heart. And this is Bo. It's okay, the word's out. <laughs> and the pictures. Uh, well, I really uh, appreciate that, Casey. You, you're, uh, you're one of my real sisters in, the, in this life. Uh, power is the ability to define reality. And I think what happens to us in our using is that we get like... Uh, we lose our grip on reality, obviously, from all the drugs. And when you can't define reality past the point, they put you in jail or bury you or put you in a, a hospital. And, you know, the road back is uh, it's still like a real God-given, you know, mysterious thing to me. And, uh, you know, I was... Uh, you know, what I share up here will, you know, be my experience, strength, and hope, and it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just, the, you know, the best I can come up with right now. And from past experience, we're dealing with unimportant details and, you know, crap all over in the past. I want to try to delete as much of that, and I'll, I'll share the things that uh, the fearful part of me doesn't want you to know about. Uh, not that they're bad things, but, I mean, they're very close to my heart. For one thing, uh, I was sort of twisted by the fact that as I grew up, I became more and more aware that my dad's dad, my grandfather, had uh, committed suicide. And that was all the more bad because he had been a multimillionaire on the gold standard. So I grew up wondering, well, money must not be the answer, you know. <laughs> Uh, more than most people would because of that. And also, if you're rich or famous or whatever, uh, I mean, I'm not rude or impolite, I hope, but I'm not necessarily impressed by money or a title. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I met Eddie Arnold, you know, a country music star. And he was at the edge of the athletic field at Georgia Tech. And he was just a guy standing there, and he was nice to me. He wasn't too nice, but he was just, you know, just a regular guy. And he was in the music business and made songs. We didn't talk a hell of a lot. We just kind of stood together for, you know, five or ten minutes. But he gave me a feel. And I think uh, what must have happened with me, I mean, for one thing, I, I harvested a field of rabbit tobacco and put it in jars. Maybe that's an attic, you know. I went around and drank the after dinner drinks after the years party the next morning, even the beers that had cigarette butts in them. You just kind of have to hold them right. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's an addict. You know, I made my own homebrew when I was like 13 or 14 years old, sugar and water on the raisins and sugar and water on the windowsill, plus nine days. The raisins come to the top. You kind of pour off the mash and do it again. <laughs> Put about an inch of sugar in the bottom, watch it disappear. Turned out how. So maybe that was addictive behavior. Or maybe it was the night that we uh, I moved out from my folks. I was standing on the Baltimore block with a bunch of beatniks down in Atlanta. 
because I really liked beating this because you could sit around and drink coffee and talk about anything. And I was 14, and they were like 18 and 20 and 30, you know. And uh, and I could talk to them about things. If I tried to talk to my teenage friends about those things, they would just, you know, what's he talking about? And uh, so maybe I was like looking for somebody to talk to way back then. I'm convinced if NA had been in my environment, I would have probably gravitated to it. Uh, you know, we got a recent interest in Stoicism because it's, the Stoa was like an outdoor place where people came and talked. And uh, I think that whole philosophy evolved behind that pre-Christian. But uh, I had more than your normal amount of questions when I was a kid. When I moved down on the block, I lived down there a good many months, and there was a uh, speed junkie from New York City, and Mary uh, Anderson, who was Bill Anderson's sister, would write the script. She would get the script from the doctor for diet pills and whatever. Shelby, the newspaper editor, would pay for it, and then Ron would do about 90% of it. And, uh, and Ron was told us that he was uh, an ex-ballet dancer from the San Francisco Ballet Troupe. In the middle of his, you know, speed talk, that would flash by every now and then, we'd come like, you know, really? But then he started teaching us ballet. <laughs> and then somebody saw him on a late night movie, you know, on the, on the screen, and at the end of the movie it said San Francisco Ballet Company. So maybe he was, I'm not really sure. But you know how it is in our world, some things sound more fantastic than others, but it doesn't mean they're untrue. And uh, so he also said, well, I was down in Brazoria, Texas, and I was in jail with this guy that said he had, had an alligator ranch, and uh, he's gonna send me some uh, peyote from old Mexico next time we run down there. And I, he said, he's, he said, he just sent it last week, so I'll be here any time. I went on. And somebody stole the pink slip, tried to damn swipe the dope, and they couldn't, they wouldn't let them have it in the post office. So, long ago. so we all cut it up and ate the peyote. I mean, maybe that was evidence of addiction. And stay high all night and play pals of people and lights on the ceiling and went out and left notes on cars. Dear Fred, be right back. It's very spooky. And, uh, but, uh, and he also said that I had I was emotionally selfish, which I thought was very discerning, if anybody would say. And uh, I think what it is is like a lot of us. I just feel things so passionately that I, if I'm not careful, I get overwhelmed with my emotions and stuff. So I, I try to pick people that I feel safe with, you know, before I'll share my heart because. Well, in hell, you don't want to be crying in, a bunch of, in front of a bunch of enemies and stuff, right? I mean, I guess you could, but, you know, I'm weird, but I ain't that weird. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so years passed, and my first lover was out of that crowd. She was 19, I was 14. And uh, seven years later, she became my second wife. And uh, so... I read a Stephen King book called, I uh, can't think of the name of it right now, it'll come to me, maybe it was one of the Richard Bachman series, but it was about this this, uh, this play, come, no, it was, it was a science fiction thing, some kid uh, made the invention, and it was supposed to be good, but it wound up killing everybody on the planet. <laughs> but in the, in the early part of it, he's talking about this one guy being like a genius, but his compass would wander, and he could never really settle on anything. And anything he tried to do, he could do and do rather well, but he just couldn't maintain, couldn't hold the interest in it. And then finally it locked on something, and then he said, Stephen King said that in the book, that's kind of like a way it is for some people, because they finally find their, magnet, their true north, and after that they're goal-directed. Well, that's the way I am with Narcotics Anonymous. Because every damn thing, I mean, college, the beatniks, the hippies, marching against the war, getting shot out of the Klan, all that fits in with me being an NA member. A little bit of college. I mean, I made an F on my first uh, 
exam in English 101, and I made an A plus on my seventh. I just climbed the scale. I, you know, F, D, C, D, A, A plus. And he walked over to the desk and said, what happened there, Miss Sewell? And I said, well, apparently you taught me how to write a theme. <laughs> Which is another way of saying stay on the subject. Uh, my mind, mind still wanders sometimes. But uh, I do know about thematic structure, at least knowing about it. And uh, so I went there for two and a half years, but on the way to school one day I had a bad motorcycle wreck and I was laid up for a couple of months to have doing a lot in my brother and I went back to college. Also, since I didn't go back to college, I was now qualified for the draft, so the draft, sent me, the draft board sent me a notice, which made me a little nervous. Um, and you know, this is just my take on it, right? This may not be real, it might be very real. Uh, my objection to going to Vietnam was that while I might be good, at killing people, it might not be good for me. And plus, I really didn't want to do it. I had heard the football scores given one night, and right after the football scores, they said, and 50 U.S. killed, and 500 South Vietnamese, and 5,000 North Vietnamese. And the very next night, more football scores, and 75 Americans killed, 750 South Vietnamese and 7,500 North Vietnamese. I realized the figures were just bogus crap. And I got real suspicious that I might do well to not trust our national government too much. And, uh, <laughs> and years later, with this situation on my hands, I thought, well, you know what? I could just try real hard to dodge the draft, and then if I make it, then fine, I'm off the hook. And if I don't, just get my gun and go to murdering people. Try to come through alive and unmaimed. And uh, so this one friend of mine, Dave Baker, his dad had Baker Audio in Atlanta. We did some drugs together. But uh, he told, he gave me a, a list of things to do when you go down to the draft board so that they don't take you. Like see bleeding things on the ceiling and they'll set you out in a little room and they come in snapping to them. when they give the hearing test say when you hear it say I can't hear nothing and when it stops beeping go like there it is <laughs> and similar things and uh, so they sent me the psychiatrist this guy's talking about how much good two years in the service is going to do me he says what do you he has me down for psychomotor service he says what do you do for a living I said out there in newspapers I want, you know, and he said how many do you throw I said about 500 a night well, I mean, you can't do that with psychomotor services. <laughs> you can't. I mean, do the math. You get the papers at two, they got to be delivered by six. But I'm kind of, really kind of an eight man, you know? I really am. And, uh, and so when, uh, when I got TNA, I think the first thing, oh, hell. I ran a nonprofit thing down the strip in Atlanta for two years. The last year it got so crazy and so rough that a couple of times uh, I became famous on the 6 and 11 o'clock news. And uh, you would tell your boyfriend that I'd pissed your ass or something, and then he'd want to beat my ass and get me down an alley and be like attacking me. And I'd fight my way out of it. And I'd been a fighter in school and all that, like a star wrestler and all that. But I started getting nervous because sooner or later, you know, the guys were getting bigger. I started carrying a gun. And uh, I had a lot of restraint. I mean, one biker, you know, beat me up and down the sidewalk, and I beat him back. I said, look, Tony, I don't know what the hell this is about. If I was mad, I'd have shot you by now. And he looked down with six gun. And he said, let's, let's go get him here. <laughs> I said, okay. And I never even found out what the fight was about. I mean, that's how it was down there. The main thing that I learned in those two years is that there was no hope anywhere on the planet Earth for addict seeking recovery. No hope anywhere. Not in Tibet, not in Europe. I'm sure not Atlanta. And that's scary because I think part of my little addictive imagination I was predicated that there was like something out there, you know, that you could go on to, but really there's nothing. And, uh, damn, 
that was that bothered me. And uh, I had read this book called The Beats. That's B E A T S for anybody that transcribes this tape, not B W E T S, and uh, <laughs> like beatniks. And there was a chapter in there on Sinanon. And it said that it met in a building where a uh, chapter of Narcotics Anonymous held its meetings. So that was the first time I knew the name. And then years later when I was on the strip, I called up Chuck Dietrich and flew out and visited Sinanon. Played some Sinanon games. But uh, that was before they started putting rattlesnakes in the mailboxes. <laughs> but... Uh, but they, and I heard the first, I was asked about the 12 steps. I guess a lot of people have a 12 step story. And I said, What are these steps? Is that a ladder or something? <laughs> I keep talking about the steps. And I'd never heard of them. And I was still drinking on the strip, of course. And I mean, nobody ever suggested I might be, a, you know, like not doing that or limited to some extent. I mean, I'm chug lugging fist, carrying a six gun, never shot anybody. But. It's just a miracle. So right at the end of that is when I first called Narcotics Anonymous, seek, really seeking help from me, actually. And uh, there was no list in Atlanta. So I called around, called AA, somebody there said they knew somebody that might have a white booklet and blah, blah, blah. So I got a copy of that and held seven meetings. That was in 1971. And then my clean date is July 10th. 1974. I got married again. You know, the marriage slowly fell apart again and got divorced again. And right at the end of it is when I started, uh, I went over to where I'd gone to one of the AA meetings with a guy that had been my vice president and uh, Jim. And he's been in that program all these years. I started going there about a month later. I mean, within a week, I was going to a meeting a day just checking it out. I didn't have anything else to do. And uh, within a, nine days, they made me coffee chair. Within That was July. Sometime in August, uh, they had the NA meeting out of Peachford. And I, I didn't want to go to that, but I did. And I liked it. I just kept going back for five years. So slowly, over a period of time, over three years, we went from one meeting a week to two meetings a week to three meetings a week to four meetings a week to five meetings a week. And I went to a meeting a day. I went to 110 meetings my first 90 days. And every time there's a new NA meeting, I'll drop one of the AA meetings. And finally, after three years, I was going to seven meetings a week, all NA. Well, all of a sudden, the damn talk about, you know, NA and who's working on this, is there a book, where's WSO or whatever it is, where's group conscience, we had a copy of the tree. And... Uh, we weren't getting real clear answers from the West Coast, so we flew out there in 77 and uh, to a world convention in San Francisco. And in that three years, and I think this is very telling and very important, I was really scared that, that there was something good to get in NA. I mean, if you really wanted to, and that you had to work the steps to get it, I was afraid that I would rush ahead and get so involved with the other crap that I wouldn't get recovery. I'd never really worked my steps. So I just agonized over surrender. I mean, I double worked step two and got me a whole new belief system. I mean, God is a she. And I checked it all out. And I'd never done that before, and it was very revealing. And naturally, I had, what, fear and inhibition. I didn't want to do it, but I did anyway. Because I wanted to be one of the ones that didn't walk out the door, and I wanted to stay clean and see what all this was about. It was the most interesting thing in the world to me at that point. <laughs> Well, more than just the level of wanting recovery for myself. Hell, the first nine months, it was kind of hard for me to imagine what recovery would be like. I was drinking, but I didn't give a fuck about it. I mean, I'd get drunk, but uh, there was no compulsion. Uh, as far as I know, I'd never done any DTs or anything. It was not hard to put down. You got to, like, not drink to go to these meetings, like, whoop do do And, uh, you know, I'd stopped shooting drugs earlier. And that was different. I couldn't talk for about two years. So. Imagine both so like man. But, but uh, in this three years that I was really working my steps and step four and five and six and seven and you know step seven being a, a Doug Fiend's dream come true, get to be another person. You know, if the steps work, you get to be another person. You stop being your old self, get to be a new self. 
maybe a self where the dreams come true. And I think the steps move from the inside to the outside, really to the cosmos. But you start with the surrender, the admissions, you change your belief system. Your mind filters, the eye cannot see and the ear cannot hear, that which the mind cannot contain. And so when you clear your system, then you can start seeing things that are really there and stop seeing the hallucinations. And uh, so, and I think God works the fourth step when you turn your life and your will over. Because what addict could be fearless and thorough about anything? And, uh, you know, eight and nine extend the process. Well, anyway, I took all this real serious because I didn't want to get loaded. I mean, everybody that came to N.A. in 1974 got loaded except me. And it was just very damn few. Go to your conventions. I mean, you'll, you know, 20, 30 years, 29, 28, you know, nobody hardly ever stands up. So... It's sad, you know. I, my hope for this weekend is that this will be a step towards the cessation of the infighting and the hatred and backstabbing and the, the stuff that we've suffered from. Uh, and I told some of the people who upset at the conference here, I said, bring these people together. They need to damn hear each other talk. They need to get over that shit, put closure on it, process it, let's get on with it. I mean, a lot of really good things have happened, a lot of really good people have died. Uh, you know, we don't need to be living in the past. I mean, it's no legacy to Jimmy K. Jimmy K was a friend of mine. It's no legacy. Hatred is not supposed to be part of his legacy. Jimmy would not approve. I just tell you that. As far as all this stuff about the office, I write about this stuff and this, that, and the other. So I'm not even going to trot out my little scenario of what happened with the key at the office. Um, well, maybe I should for the tape, but it'll, I'll keep it brief. I think Bob Stone came in there. Jimmy had not brought by the office for a few days, and Bob Stone found out that a lot of people had keys to the office, so he got new keys made, probably one for Jimmy, and Jimmy hadn't picked it up yet. But the moment that he hit the door, the door was locked, and he felt he was locked out and left. So there was no chance to rush out and give him, here's your key, Jimmy. Because everybody expected, and my crew, everybody expected Jimmy to stay on and play a, a symbolic leadership role, and we were all happy to acquiesce to that. But like has been otherwise said on the tape, you know, we'd beg Jimmy, I'd call him, written, gone by his place, and ask him to please, you know, get involved, write something. We wanted to put part of another look, which is his story, into the basic text, a perfect place, plug it right in. He wouldn't, wouldn't do that. So after a while, we just accepted and shrimp. You know, the great thing about acceptance is you don't have to understand. You just accept it and get to go on. So it's kind of pitiful. Uh, Doug F. came up to me and said, you got to get Jimmy involved in the book. I says, well, that's a marvelous idea. Doug, we never thought of that. <laughs> Why don't you help with that? Because we called him and written him into the house many times. We don't seem to be getting anywhere, so maybe you can do it. Well, anyway, he's been pissing me ever since. <laughs> so I can understand that. But anyway, I'm not pissed at anybody. I'm not pissed at him. I'm not pissed at anybody else. We just need to stop fighting. It's bad for our children in recovery. It confuses them, and it makes them think that old-timers really do hate each other. And I hope that's not so, because I do believe in the recovery process. So... Uh, and it always confused us, and I said this at lunch, and I'll say it now because it's one of the things I was saying, talking about earlier that I wouldn't want to share. Uh, I asked Greg Pierce years later why the Californians were so upset with us. And what he said, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but what Greg Pierce actually said, being a Californian, from California, he said, well... Their time to write the book came, and they tried and found it to be impossible. In their experience, therefore, when they see you all doing it, it pisses them off because you're doing the impossible, so that you must be up to something. So I thought, well, huh, I'll store that away for future reference. <laughs> but, you know... I would surely like to think that all the people that get to get clean and stay clean and at least have a chance to go into a spiritual life 
is a better, a great replacement for that flood of people that used to come and leave, come and leave, and come. And 50 people to show up, and 49 would leave, because that's where it used to be. And we used to have people cruising through our rooms laughing at us, picking up chicks, and, and the NA doesn't work, and you got to go to AA for real recovery. I told them they was writing on the book. I said, if you want that to stop, help us get the book done. And uh, so I just want, want it to be known in the general fellowship and for, you know, just mark it down. The people that wrote your basic text, and I'm one of them, uh, had some, you can't say about outcomes, because in a way we were willing to fail. But what we talked about and verbalized among ourselves was like, well, <clears throat> if we're going to hit, if we're going to fail, we're going to get a runner start and hit that wall so hard that when our brains splatter everywhere, somebody is better than us and smarter than us and more able to do it, we'll come forward and get that ball rolling. <laughs> and you know, God gave us the luck. What can I say? I hope you don't think we wrote it. We were there. But we prayed to be used as an instrument. The real lit prayer was God uh, free me from self-will and ego and give me sufficient strength and guidance to do your footwork. At that point, get the word out. So we wrote a letter and the word went out. Office WSO. Jimmy Kennan said, you're on the WSO lit committee. You're on the board of trustees lit committee. Write us a letter, Bo, because I'd been writing stuff at San Diego because I'd met Greg in San Francisco and met Jimmy, too, and a bunch of other people. So I wrote a little letter. I said, well, why am I writing a letter? I mean, why don't you guys write it? I ain't nothing. I ain't elected anything. And that's when Jimmy said I was on all those spores. I said, well, I don't remember the election, but if you say I'm on there. <laughs> uh, so I wrote this letter, and uh, I, was, I lucked out that day. I got successfully insulting. The key line, I've been told, in the letter was that the reason we don't have a book is because nobody has really tried yet, or they just don't know the need. <laughs> and that pissed them off just enough to get them right without making them walk away. So, I mean, that's what somebody told me. But, uh, you know, and then I had studied Dale Carnegie because, you know, just being a kid, I remember when I was 16, I read uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's the key principle in there, and he evaluated everything. What's the key, you know, come on, people, what's the key urge for our species? What is the deepest craving in human nature? What is the deepest craving? Is it food? Is it sex? Is it money? What is the deepest craving in human nature? The craving to be appreciated. Most of us, if we're ever really appreciated, react with tears. Most of us come from families where addiction is born. And uh, Mama thinks I'm good for cutting the yard. To this day. All this other stuff confuses her. <laughs> and I do cut the yard, and I'm really good at it. <sighs> Not often, though. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so when people would send in, if you wrote me a little two or three paragraphs after I was elected World Lit Chair through a sequence, uh, I think mainly over that 100 pages that I wrote. Not that it was good. I don't know that many people read it, but it was from an attic. It was 100 pages, so, you know, they made me lit chair. And uh, the conference, uh, most people don't know about the other two lit committees I was on, the WSO lit committee and the WSB. But, you know, think of them as like I was a soldier and then like little medals you know, or something, decorations for service, uh, but not killing people. And uh, so we just, we tried to be kind of flat-footed and commonsensical about it. I'd write you a letter back that was so good that you would be dying for your husband to come home or for your wife to come home. Well, honey, <laughs> you know, 
where a lit letter is. I got a little letter from the lit committee today. <laughs> look at it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We George did that terrifically. We sent out to all of our friends. And it's very important that you keep writing and doing more stuff to help us. We're so, so grateful. And here's some people close to you that you can contact their contact information. And by the time you got through showing the letter to your girlfriend later that night, she thought, I could write some more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. And I kept, you know, saying, well, we got another five or ten pages in today, or, you know, we got... 200 pages, and then it's 400 and 500. And for some reason, that didn't make any sense to the Californians. So, if you're having trouble getting results, you vary your approach, right? So I put it into pounds. I said, well, we have about 20 pounds of input. And they went like, 20 pounds? Heck, that's a lot. (laughs) And it became a real deal. And... uh, and there was a little bit of showmanship involved because I wanted the conference people to know that we really were getting input. So at the next conference I went to, uh, I had all these fouls in a big footlocker, you know, a $20 footlocker you get at like places, Walmart and stuff. So it's like full of all these fouls and stuff. So I lug it into the conference like this. <laughs> so... All these other conference attendees and watching like, what the hell's he got in the box? And now I set the box over there and left the lid open. And then it's kind of like, they'd be subtle about it. So you could see them homing in on that box. <laughs> looking down in there. And it really was input from the fellowship for the basic text. And uh, we had a first conference in, uh, let's see, I was elected in 79. And I felt like group conscious was the way to go from the beginning, so I asked the conference to set the site. They set it in Wichita because it's equidistant between coasts. And about 25 people showed up, and we had a little place in a community center in downtown Wichita. That's where Lee Jerickson is from, along with all the corn and cows. <laughs> and uh, locals call it Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> but, uh, so we worked very hard that weekend, and we did uh, minutes on how to form a lit committee, minutes on how to do a newsletter, minutes on possible chapters for the basic text, minutes on how do you fundraise within traditions, uh, and all that. Anyway, it was a, kind of a fantastic thing that ensued. The minutes were in incredibly rough shape. <coughs> And they were very hard to decipher, so they couldn't do them in Wichita, so they sent them to us. I couldn't get someone to do them or such and such to do them. Finally, I wound up going through the minutes, and they were undecipherable, I mean, except for the cover page. And, uh, but I could put together what they, what they were saying because I had been there, and I was the chair, and I'd interacted with the committees and sat in on them. So I started writing down all the stuff, you know, putting it into prose, and it, it turned into quite a few sheets of paper. It was typewritten. And uh, so I had a printer buddy in Marietta, and he said, you ought to do a booklet with all that stuff. He's an old country boy named Philip Page. And I said, a booklet? That'd be too hard. We couldn't do that. And he said, no, it ain't nothing, man. Just type it up. We'll have it typeset over here at Marietta Reaper Graphics. I'll print it on my own press for you. Give me a good price. Do a thousand copies. And uh, so we, that's what we did. And so that's how the handbook for NA Lit Committees was born. Because we just kept plugging away and didn't give up. And then, uh, amazingly, that got approved at the, uh, at the conference. We thought it was going to be a $2 a copy fundraiser for the World Lit Committee because we had no subsidy, no funds. We had to come up every dollar every stamp and every envelope and every piece of paper out of our own pockets. And we were later, about a year later, reimbursed with receipts only. So we thought that was kind of typical. But uh, to us, our people were dying. And so while we tried to keep a straight face through some of these scenarios, what we were really, it's kind of like Jews in Germany during World War II, you know, you might be nice to Nazis, but it's not because you liked them. Not that the West Coast was Nazis, but 
you know, the fun, the, the funding and the other little things that happened and all was strange. And, you know, Jimmy, going back to Jimmy for a second, well, he was always very supportive and friendly and loving and terrific and making positive suggestions and all that. But I, my fantasy is that he had some buddies working on him, whispering shit into his ears. I don't know. But some of the stuff is pretty fantastic. You know how dope things are. And uh, so that's what happened when it got left to my imagination. But anyway, we were not worried. We weren't. Our main job, and from the holy books I had studied, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and looking at all this from a grave uh, side uh, casket, uh, was to keep our eye on the ball and don't get distracted and pray for strength and guidance. And distraction was anything that would get us off the next positive thing we could do. So we just didn't get distracted. And we got the handbook done. Well, lo and behold, they thought so much of our work that even though it came out way after the 90-day review period, they decided to approve it. So the $2 went to WSO. And we got to fund ourselves for the second year. And they messed around and made me lit chair again. And uh, so we set another conference site. And the conference decided where it was going to be. The next world convention, this is an interesting fact about NA history that I don't think anybody knows because I never hear it brought up, is, you know, the AA program, you heard of that? Well, they have a young people's component, and they have a convention, and so wherever, just by luck now, when the AA young people's was in Southern California, that's where the NA world convention went. And then when the young people's AA conference was in San Francisco, that's where the next year they had the NA convention. I've been told that. I haven't even checked it out. It might be just a fucking rumor. <laughs> but the, story, the, the, the point of it, the, the good side, the important part of it, that's not a rumor, is once we started having these lit conferences, we had a lit conference in Wichita, and it got from San Francisco to Houston to Atlanta. I shared the Atlanta World Convention with no guidelines. Call me California. Give me some guidelines. There ain't none. Oh, God, you kidding? Call Houston. They might know something. I called Houston. They were all mad because they they'd they all fight after a convention, you know, the committees would. They set aside personal preference in favor of group purpose until the convention was over. Then they <laughs> I still love East, baby. And uh, God bless them. And that guy that chaired the Milwaukee World Convention, he was the one that... Uh, actually sent us a bundle of input. And do you know how many of his subcommittee chairs came forward and helped him write the input? This big, fat zero. It made him so damn mad that he made, a, he made a really good report of how to do merchandising, how to do h and I, I mean, hospitals and hospitality, and how to do a program committee and the whole thing. And so what I did was elaborate on it. I chaired a world convention. He had chaired a world convention. And he had a base document, so I elaborated on it. Then I finally got a group conscious six months later at Memphis, and I said, we're going to play a game here. You all have all got copies of it. I'm going to read it, and I'll pass the reading around. But then I want you to write down, because at some point you're going to want to say, I'd like to say such and such, and throw your hand up. Well... Before you throw your hand up, write down what you would say on the piece of paper. Then you can throw your hand up. And if you, and I'll keep my eyes on them. And if you threw that hand up, and I said, I didn't see no writing back there. And so the trick was, you wrote down what you had to say about it. And then later, I had a stack of 20 or 30 sheets, copies of the document. That's what became the approved convention guidelines several years later. Because it's group conscious. I mean, by then, I, I knew about the process. Had to involve other people with it. It doesn't matter what I think. What the hell do I know? But you get 50 people together and get what they collectively think. Now you've got something. It gets interesting. And all the little discoveries are just thrilling. You lose your fear of the process. It becomes addictively curious. I mean, it'll draw you. But, uh, so anyway, the second World Lake Conference was in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we had... Uh, this time, I think about maybe 50, 40 or 50 people show up. We were all real poor. We pooled our money and sent out for chili. And we just, you know, we were all hungry as hell and ate the chili. And we met, at, they had this a federal building in downtown Lincoln. 
I'll squeeze it in, honey. <laughs> There's lots of tapes like this, so there ain't no shortage. But, uh, so I'll try to put stuff that ain't on those tapes in this. Now, so the, the uh, Jim Inn set it up with the winos in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska to not panhandle us because we were writing a book. <laughs> and the bums got this and said, okay. <laughs> And one kid came in loaded and was so rambunctious. Uh, and I had a real surrendered, good surrendered. I could be aggressive, but I could also surrender last chair. And uh, Bob B. had showed up, and Greg P. had showed up, the board of trustees. So we got our subcommittee, the WSC, got good help from the trustees. And the system worked back then. And uh, so anyway... Uh, this kid was loaded and I didn't want to tell him I didn't want to throw him out you know I was chair I could have said I could have gone to a couple of stout fellows and said I would need to take him outside and have a little talk I didn't do none of that because I mean it's a lit conference man you don't want to damn spoil the atmosphere you know we're not a bunch of thugs so what happened was the most great thing that could have happened you know, like I was like talking out of his head a little bit and asking questions out of turn, wanting to talk for 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, this young lady sitting right here, she said, she, she realized nobody else was going to step into the moment, so she said, we're writing this book for you, but we're not going to let you stop us from writing it. So you need to go outside now. So he did. He got confused and went out. <laughs> and that was good. And then I remember sitting right here, and this little cute you know, Wichita gal came in, or Midwestern gal, cute women out there. She sits down, she's fidgeting, you know. Fidgeting. I tell she's a little nervous. I said, Have you said you let prayer? She said, What's that? I said, Well, See all those people? They said this prayer for God to remove their self will and ego and give them the strength and guidance to do his footwork. Look, we've printed out a little piece of paper here. Why don't you take it out in the hall, do your lip prayer, and then come back in? She said, Okay, okay. So she leaves with the paper. About five minutes later, she comes back in. She's throwing her hands up. And she's making them put the stuff because <laughs> the ego's out of the picture. We all knew what the rules were. We agreed to them. We all surrendered to them. So it wasn't nuts. That might have looked nuts to an outsider, but you know we were very careful about these things. And we would also do other things uh, that probably looked funny to outsiders. One one thing would be getting in people's face and asking them how they really worked a step. Or like, well, you obviously have something to say. You got to spit it out. You want to go out the alley? We'll work it over some, huh? Just kidding. But when your body hears those words and sees that body language and shit, you'll say, well, blah, 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 I actually do so-and-so. Write it down. Write it down. Thank you, sir. Write it down. <laughs> it's a stench, but it works. Well, guess what people that get out of universities and get a job at WSO out of a uh, movie company, maybe, or something like that, guess what they think of that literary technique? They think we're insane. So that's what happened to our lit process. That's why we, the lit work that I'm doing for the fellowship right now, and I work on it every single day, is outside the structure. I mean, I can't exactly explain what happened, but I mean, we set World Lit Committee up to be a support system for addicts seeking recovery and people who wanted to do good things contribute to our common welfare. And we no longer have the support system. World Lit's not there, the board trustees isn't there. We have to get anything done. We have to work outside the system. How you like that, Mr. Tate? Well, that's the truth. And plus, we're making it. I mean, the stuff reads good. I get all teared up. I can talk about it okay, but when I read it, I get teared up. Yeah, there's so much love and caring and concern and beauty in there. It's the N.A. Way of Life book is uh, the application of spiritual principles. As a continuation of where the basic text left off, the basic text is basic because we were young then. We didn't get input on employment, so we didn't feel it was our place to make up nothing. We didn't get input on parenting, so we didn't think it was our place to make up nothing. 
We didn't get input on getting over abuse and neglect and recovery. We didn't feel it was our place to make up anything. Today, we get plenty of input on those things. We have fine chapters. We even got a chapter on sex. So we call it a not-so-basic text for adults. <laughs> and every, every week, I ship more books than WSO shipped in the 20 years preceding the basic texts. And I do it under the NA Foundation group. And we send surplus funds to WSO, and they send us nice little thank you notes. <laughs> so we're happy. I hope they're happy. I hope y'all are happy. And I hope that many good miracles come from this conference. There were other conferences, but like I say, there are, you don't, I got five whole minutes. Left. <laughs> yeah, don't stop it too early. <laughs> no, fair is fair. The sign says five. <laughs> oh, please share your vision. She's helping me. My friends seem to understand these things. Please share your vision of the future of NA. When I first got married the first time, I've been married more seven times. The first time, we went down to Rich's department store, we were going to buy a couch. I walked in, I saw this couch, it looked good to me, I was ready to go right then. But I went around the store, looked at every other damn couch that was in the entire place, came back to couch number one, ordered it, and they shipped it. I think that's how the fellowship thinks. So when in fallow periods, I figure the fellowship's out to lunch thinking about it. And I do believe in waveform for a lot of things, including our fellowship. And I, uh, I think that the fellowship has come to a place now where they're starting to ask questions again, they're starting to think again, they're starting to evaluate answers and verify or deny facts, supposed facts, purported facts. I mean, we have a very interesting language within uh, our NA society. I remember the years that we learned misinformation, disinformation, and all that. And you know, if it's raw data, it's raw data. If it's in formation, it becomes a phone book. But try cutting up a phone book and putting each little piece of paper in a box. Now, family, Mary Jones's phone number. You can't do it. It's not in formation. So we're coming into an era where people are hungry for real facts and they're willing to sacrifice the personal preference for group goals like we're all doing. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I tell people, I say, anything that World Services is not doing, you do it. If you want a world director, you make a world director. Somebody here could go home, and tonight before morning, if you kept at it, you could find enough regional mailing, uh, meeting lists to compose a world directory in Archives Anonymous and print out, go to sleep. <laughs> You'd be tired. But, I mean, you know, in the old days, we couldn't do that. You know, if you say if you need some H and I somewhere, you need some uh, help with public information or lit literature or whatever, just innovate. I mean, we we got a history now. You got tapes now. You can check out our techniques. I've written books on how the basic text was written, so you can access all that. If you have any trouble, ask one of us. Uh, I'll let this be my closing thing because this will be a good place to close it. Uh, there are more conferences. We, the one rule that I have that fortunately I never kicked anybody's ass over this or got them just thrown out of a committee over it, but our rule was that we never speak ill of others. Get that? Never. Why? Because it rebounds on you. You may feel powerful for a moment or two, but you just don't see it coming. But if you speak ill, or if you actually wish harm to somebody else, then you're going to have four flat tires in a row. That's where that, when you don't do that, that's when you have them good days. So all of us try to be careful about that. Uh, and as far as I know, in my experience, I never heard all our entire expectation about Jimmy K and the WSO is that he would go on there in an honored position. Not as some kind of stupid figurehead, but as... Like, if you want to know Jimmy K, get the 20th and 21st anniversary tapes because he speaks well on those tapes. And when people speak well of Jimmy K, that's what they're speaking about. Not when he's sick, not when he's in the hospital, not when he's dying, but he's like in his prime. And for 10 years or so, especially in the in 1970s, everybody has a phone number in the world. If you had trouble with your meeting or your service committee or whatever in the hell, you could always get Jimmy K. Am I right, Terry? 
And everybody in the whole fellowship, including Bo, called Jimmy K. And uh, he helped everybody. And then he got a little older, so what? That ain't a crime. I'm, I'm not but 58, and I'm getting weird. <laughs> Check me out in 10 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, your memory starts to go a little bit. Like, cowards go further. Somebody change the rules when I change 50, turn 50. Okay, but anyway, when the basic test got approved by the committee in Miami, Florida, after the Miami World Convention, you remember I said the World Convention, the Lit Committee followed each other. Miami World Convention, Miami Lit Conference. And we weren't done after a week, so we stayed over in the clubhouse for a few more days and got done. And what we knew it was done was because people started saying, well, change this. And somebody said, no, we reviewed that at the last conference. Well, change that. No, that's mentioned over here. So the committee as a whole... And I ran out in the hall with Joseph, and I said, they're done. We ain't going to do another thing on this book. So that's when it was approved. I went back in, I suggested, they all raised their hands, and bam, there it was. Whew. The miracle happened. I was out on the beach with Jim M., Greg P., Joe Proctor, and myself, and Jim and Joe and I functioned. Uh, and Greg Pierce was like our mentor or something. And... Uh, we were like a triangle, and I was good at some things, and Jim was good at some things, and Joe was real good at some things. And, but together, we were a good team. And uh, we were on the beach, and the book was done. And the moon was like that. And uh, we were talking about various things in the future, the future. And I said, I, I want us to go forward and do for others what's been done for us. And if we run into people that want to do some good thing for our kind of synonymous, that we help them. We give them information that we have. We introduce them to people they need to meet. And we uh, call those people and let them know they're coming where they'll be well received and ease the way for them. And I've become in the last few years, especially about, I think, the last five years, NA is a family. NA is a very large extended family. It's not a tribe. Uh, if it were a tribe, I would be a chieftain. Where are my feathers? <laughs> uh, it's a large family. Uh, it's ruled by the moment, and who needs what, and who's got it, and how can we get it to them? And every one of us plays a role in that. And in as a society, you, you people need to study your fellowship as a society. What are the social rules of Narcotics Anonymous? Fill in the big blank. Uh, why don't we savage newcomers? What happens when we fuck over newcomers? Sell them insurance, sex, whatever form it takes. The only thing really bad about sex is that it gives them excuses to say, you don't really care about me, you just want to fuck me. So you don't want to, you don't want to fall in that trap. I mean, their disease wants them to use, right? So if they can get over on you, they're good to go. So we don't, after a while, we learn the rules and we don't let them get over us because we love them, we don't want them to die. And if you want to get laid, get laid on your own damn time, you know? <laughs> Plenty of that. But... Uh, but anyway, that's our vision for the future, is that you people and what you're learning, you share it with others and they share it with others. And you learn more and build more and have other conferences like this and put it in writing. And if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I read what you wrote this year. It's a bunch of shit. You say, exactly where is the bunch of shit? Is? What's the page number? <laughs> and what would you like to see corrected? And if at all possible, correct it. Who gives a damn? Let's get it right. And if it's in right, if it's right, let's put it in writing. Because if it's not in writing, the disease can play with it easier. And Camus said, writers write. Writers are driven to write. I have to write. Thank you. <laughs>